You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the twilight zone. The twilight zone. The twilight zone. Welcome to another episode of the Master Mind, Body, and Spirit Show. Today's guest began researching altered states of consciousness with Bob, geez, Bob Monroe at Monroe Laboratories in the early 1970s, where he and a few others were instrumental in getting Monroe's laboratory for the study of consciousness up and running. These early drug-free consciousness pioneers helped design experiments, develop the technology for creating specific altered states, and were the main subjects or guinea pigs of study all at the same time. He has been experimenting with and exploring the subjective and objective mind ever since. For the past 30 years, he has been focused on scientifically exploring the properties, boundaries, and abilities of consciousness. During that time period, he has excelled as a working scientist, a professional physicist dedicated to pushing back the frontiers of cutting-edge technology, large system simulation, technology, development, and integration, and complex system vulnerability and risk analysis. Presently, and for the past 20 years, he has been at the heart of developing U.S. missile defense systems. He has been a serious explorer of the frontiers of reality, mind, consciousness, and psychic phenomena since the early 1970s. His books, My Big Toe, is a model of existence and reality that is based directly on his scientific research and firsthand experience. It represents the results and conclusions of 30 years of careful scientific exploration of the boundaries and contents of reality from both the physical and metaphysical viewpoints. Welcome to the show, Tom Campbell. Well, thank you very much, Matthew. Glad to be here. I think we're going to have a interesting uh, time today. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm so excited to chat with you today. Um, normally on bios, I'll get uh, you know bios and I'll shorten them a little bit. But for yours, um, I knew it was necessary to definitely read it all out and just let the audience know all the amazing stuff you've been doing for a long time. Um, do you want to just start out with a little bit about your background, some of the incredible research that you've done, and just give a little brief history of how you've got to where you are today? Ah, uh, okay. Well, I hope this is going to be a long show because that will take just a little bit of time, but I'll try to keep it short. Keeping things short is a, a little difficult for me, but let's see how I do with this. All right. Um, as, uh, as you heard in the bio, I uh, ran into Bob Monroe back in about 1972, and uh, I just had gotten out of graduate school. I'm a physicist, and I just gotten out of graduate school. Started my first uh, job, and uh, was given a book by my boss called Journeys Out of the Body. Well, that was a book that Bob Monroe had written, and the boss tosses me this book and says, "Tom, read this and tell me what you think." Well, I'd only been working for a couple of months. And, you know, when your boss tells you to do something, of course you do it. So that was a little outside of my normal, uh, you know, requirements and where I worked. But uh, anyway, I did that. I read the book. And, you know, my report back to the boss was, well, if this guy's just trying to make a buck by telling wild stories, you know, he's got some pretty interesting stories. But if it's real and he's really experiencing this stuff, then wow, you know, that's another whole part of reality that uh, would really be uh, fun and interesting to know about. Well, it turned out within a month after that, we find out Bob Monroe lives about 45 minutes away from where we work. So we made an arrangement to go out and meet the guy. And of course, I wanted to find out, you know, um, you know, is this guy, you know, a shill? You know, is this guy just, you know, trying to make money on, on fanciful books? Or is he for real? 
So I got to meet the guy and I found out he was very, very much for real. He was very down to earth. He wasn't trying to sell anything. It wasn't about money. Geez, he lived on about 500 uh, acre estate, you know, in the Virginia countryside with whiteboard fences and horses and, you know, the whole thing. You know, it's probably a multi million dollar estate. So making, you know, 20 or 30 thousand dollars a year on books was not exactly important to him. So it uh, turned out he was for real and he had a burning desire to make this out of body experience that he just happened to him. He didn't want it to happen to him. It happened to him and he couldn't make it not happen to him. It scared him half to death. But once he finally realized that, you know, well, this is going to be happening to me, I might as well play with it. I might as well see what it is. So he started doing that and keeping a record, a journal, which is what his book, Journeys Out of the Body, was just his his journal, really, on his experiences. So in any case, he had an idea that he wanted to make this science. He wanted to make it credible. He wanted to um, help teach other people how to do this. He didn't want to just be the, you know, the strange guy that had these funny experiences. He wanted it to be more, more uh, you know, available than that. He wanted it to be real in the minds of, of other people. So he's also looking for a little, uh, um, you know, support that he wasn't the only one. So when I met him, he was looking for some scientists to man a lab. He had just built this building, didn't really have anything in it, didn't know what he was going to do with it, but he was going to study consciousness. And it reminds me of that movie, uh, you know, build it and they will come, you know, with the guy what, with the baseball field, right? You build it and they will come. Well, he didn't know exactly what was going to happen, but he knew he was supposed to build it. So he did, and he had this facility. And I came along just at the right time that he was finishing up that. So we made a deal, and that's that I would be, you know, a, a scientist working uh, in his laboratory, and of course that would be for free. I wasn't looking for any any gain from it, other than what I would learn, and uh, he uh, would teach me how to go out of body and experience the things that he experienced, because I knew, as a scientist, that if I didn't experience it, then it really wouldn't be real for me. You know, it's, it's only intellectual if you don't do it. If you read it in a book, it's all intellectual. It's not real for you in an experiential sense. So that was the agreement. And it was myself and uh, a double E electrical engineer, friend of mine who both worked at the same place, Dennis Menrick. So we started in 1972, spending about 20 hours a week with Bob Monroe in his lab, so that was my night job. And then my day job, of course, I was doing physics and, uh, you know, working uh, uh, actually for uh, Army Technical Intelligence at the time in 1972. So that's how I started. So my career as a physicist and my career as a researcher in consciousness started just about the same time. Within a few months of each other, they started. And I've since then, since 72, of course, a lot of years have, have gone by and both careers are still working uh, pretty much at full tilt. You know, I've, I've retired from my, from my physics career, although I didn't actually retire. You know, my retirements come in stages. I've, I've retired three times. Every time I retire, I end up getting pulled back for some reason or other. So the third time I retired, I basically retired to work on my books and questions and, and started my own physics, still doing physics. And I have some uh, uh, six experiments that are out on YouTube. If you go to the YouTube experiment, uh, YouTube videos I have, look for MBT LA, MBT for my big toe, hyphen LA for Los Angeles. And I gave a talk out there about uh, not quite a year ago where I um, offered up a set of physics experiments that would verify the my big toe um, philosophy and theory. So uh, that is yet uh, to have those be done, but we're working on that. So we get some some big name uh, physics group at the university to do those experiments. That will be nice. So I'm still doing physics. These are quantum mechanics experiments that I have out there, and they're all. Uh, I explain them all. And when I explain them, I don't explain them to physicists because that's such a limited audience. So don't feel like, oh, I can't, you know, listen to physics experiments. That'll be too dense. 
it's not like that. I all my talks, all my work, I I try to make it understandable just to the average person who's interested. So you will be able to follow it, and you will be able to understand it if you go and and listen to that. So anyway, uh, you know, I spent um, oh five to eight years. Uh, putting in time with Bob and Rowe, learning how to go out of body, learning to get around in the larger consciousness system, and probably within about a year and a half of of going out, then it, then it wasn't um, uh, TMI, which is the Monroe Institute. TMI didn't exist yet. This was before there was a TMI, and this was at Whistlefield Farm in Virginia, not not Faber, Virginia, where TMI is located. So this is kind of predates the Monroe Institute. Anyway, uh, Dennis and I learned to go out of body on demand when we wanted to, and we practiced things that were evidential because both Dennis and I were very skeptical. He's an engineer, I'm a physicist. If you can't, you know, you can't convince us of anything very easily. We need to be able to see it and measure it and feel it. And otherwise it's just not real for us. That's the way we techies are. So it was like that, but eventually, we did so much evidential things. Um, you know, we did remote viewing and then checked to see whether we actually were there and could see what was there and we got it right. We did healing with our intents. Uh, we just did all sorts of things, anything that we could think of that would be evidential. And eventually Dennis and I had probably, you know, uh, data that was like 10,000 to one that we were really doing things that were very paranormal. We were getting information and seeing things and hearing things and being aware of things that there just wasn't any way for us to do that in any normal sense. But there's a big difference in knowing that intellectually and in getting it at the gut level, at the being level, it's two different things. So even though I was doing it, and even though the statistics said we were doing something that was thousands of times beyond what you would get just by chance, which is what it would be if it was just luck. I still didn't really believe it because it's just hard to believe until Dennis and I went out one time. We were at the lab. Bob had this, this idea what he was going to do with us. And he said, okay, you two go out of body, meet up above the lab and then go on an out of body adventure together. And so what, the way we did this is we were in what was called check units, which is an acronym for something or other, I don't remember. But anyway, we were in a check unit, which was a little bedroom, if you will, that was completely isolated acoustically and electromagnetically. It had, it had sheet metal in the walls that was all grounded. So there was, you know, there was no magnetic fields could get through. Uh, it had uh, inches and inches of, of uh, acoustic insulation between the walls. So you could go in there and shout, and outside the room, nobody would hear you. It was like that. And it had a microphone coming down from the ceiling just above our mouths. We were lying in little uh, water beds, and, and it had a microphone, and we would talk. And Bob would be in the control room, and he could talk to us. That's how he guided us. That's how he explained to us what we were doing, and that's how he taught us how to go out of, out of, out of body. And... So we were used to being out of body, but still talking at the same time. It's like you're parallel processing. Your mouth and your vocal cords are still working here in this reality, but your mind is in some other reality. And it takes a little time to, to work that, but eventually you can, that becomes normal. And that's what we were doing. So Dennis and I were in two separate of these check units. There were three check units in a row and I was in number one, Dennis was in number three. So there was an empty one between us. So it was really double insulation as far as acoustics go. And he had a control. He could talk to either one of us individually, or he could talk to both of us together and he would uh, record everything we said and what he said. So we had a recording of the whole thing. And that's how we normally work. That was just the typical way we worked. Well, in this time, he had us going out of body together and he would talk to us only individually. And he was very careful about leading the witness. He, he never gave us any hint, you know, about what he knew from his point of view. It was always, you know, just individually he talked to us, but he was recording both of us. So we did this, and it was a very evidential out of body. You know, we saw things, went places, had conversations with people, you know, without bodies, et cetera. We did a lot of stuff. And then at the end, uh, about 
I don't know, it's probably close to two hours worth of, uh, worth of out of body. We come out and kind of stumble out of these, these little booths because by then you've been in this comatose state for a couple of hours. The body doesn't work real well for the first few seconds. And so we come stumbling out of these booths and go out into the, to the uh, control room. And Bob looked at us with this big grin on his face and he says, well, do you two think you were together? And we looked at each other and said, well, yeah, it seemed like that. And Dennis said the same sort of thing. And he said, well, listen to this. And he flipped both of our, our tapes. At that time, everything's on cassette tape. So he flipped both of our cassette tapes on at the same time so that you could hear what Dennis was saying, what I was saying, you know, playing together with on these tapes. And there it was on tape, Dennis and I having conversations. Of course, we're both lying in booths, doubly isolated from each other acoustically. And we're on this tape talking to each other and communicating. And we both saw the same things. Oh, look at that. Oh, yeah, I see that. It's a da, da, da. yeah, and it's got this on it too. Yeah, I see that. And all this is going on. We have conversations with other entities. So there was a all of the stuff was going on, and it was perfectly clear that we were seeing the same things, talking about the same things, doing the same things. So that was when it hit me at the at the gut level. That's when you know I spent the next two or three weeks muttering to myself, oh my God, it's real. Oh my God, it's real, you know? And uh, that uh, did that for a couple of weeks. And after that, I got over it. After that, I never questioned it anymore. Is it real? It wasn't a question for me anymore. It's just, that was, that was the end of the, is it real? And from then on, it was just, okay, how does it work? <laughs> what are the boundaries? What can you do here? What can't you do here? Why does it work that way? Where did it come from? I'm a scientist. Those are the kinds of questions I need to, to ask and find answers to. So then I spend the next 35 years trying to answer those questions. And so it's a long time between 1972 and 2002. But in 2002, I published the book, My Big Toe, which is basically was to be a, a theory of consciousness. Uh, I knew that consciousness was was the was the source. Consciousness was the fundamental thing, and that everything else was derived from consciousness. That was clear to me from you know the the work that I had done at Monroe and then on my own later. And I didn't have a lot of details though, though I knew that was the case because I knew that I could affect things in this reality with my consciousness. You know, I could use my intent and modify, you know, future probability. What happened here? I could heal. You know, I could uh, understand what was going to happen when. I got information all the time that was paranormal that you couldn't have otherwise. I knew that consciousness was the key fundamental block of reality. Then about, uh, so I, I published this theory of consciousness, my big toe. I had a little bit of physics in it. You know, I, I knew some of the the, you know, the major, some of the big things in it. But then a couple of years after I had it published, um, I got a, uh, an email from the, from a fellow that was uh, helping me work the, the, um, the, my big toe, uh, what do we call it? Forum, you know, where we had discussions and things and something in his email just kind of rang my bell. It was one of those aha moments. And I said, ah, that makes perfect sense. It was a and what he was talking about was a completely different subject, but that's all right. Just the way he said it, rang that bell. And I realized that the exact same theory, the exact same uh, precepts and concepts that describe consciousness would also explain quantum mechanics. And I thought, wow, that's really neat. You know, I understand quantum mechanics. You know, nobody understands quantum mechanics, you know, even uh, people who are, you know, the experts in quantum mechanics don't understand quantum mechanics, but you know, then I did, I saw it. When you look at it from a virtual reality viewpoint, then quantum mechanics isn't weird science anymore. It's perfectly logical science. And you can explain what's going on, why it's going on, and you can predict the outcome of, a, of an experiment. Don't have to do the math. All you have to do is do the logic. It's understandable. So that was a big deal. And I said, well, gee, if I got quantum mechanics, what about relativity? That's the other big one. I thought about it for a couple of days and shazam, there it was. You know, relativity fell out as well. You see, relativity is based on the concept that speed of light is a constant. Speed of light being a constant is really a very weird thing. 
um, velocities are always additive. They're never constant. In other words, if I'm in a car, I'm going 30 mile an hour. While I'm going 30 mile an hour, I'm, I got a baseball in my hand. I put my arm out the window and I throw the baseball at 30 mile an hour. Well, that baseball now is going 60 mile an hour relative to the ground because it's 30 mile an hour from the car, 30 mile an hour from my throw because my throw is relative to the car. I throw it 30 mile an hour faster than the car's going because I'm in the car going 30 mile an hour. So vol velocities are always additive, except for one, and that's the speed of light. And it doesn't matter how fast the source of the light is, light always goes exactly the same velocity. It's a constant. And that's a mystery of, of relativity that no scientists had a clue of why, they just know that if you make that assumption that that's true and measurements say that's true, now you come up with the science of relativity. You end up with a whole theory that's based on that fact, really is the core fact that drives relativity is that the C is a constant. And it appeared to me, if this is a virtual reality, well, virtual realities are just like, you know, the Sims or the World of Warcraft, you know, they're computed. If it's a computed reality, you've got, you know, you've got pixels, you've got a quantum of time, which is the smallest unit of time there is. Time isn't continuous, it comes in chunks. And you've got the, small, the smallest unit of distance or volume in this case, it comes in chunks, it's not continuous either. So neither time and space are continuous. And if that's the case, the fastest that you can move through a virtual reality is by moving one pixel of distance for every pixel of time. See, one quantum of distance for every quantum of time. You can't get any faster than that without jumping over multiple pixels. You know, you can't move 10 pixels of distance for one unit of time, that's teleporting. If you're gonna, use, if you're gonna make a space that is contiguous, you know, that everything is smooth and works nicely, then it has to be one pixel of distance for one pixel of time, that's the speed limit. Every virtual reality has a speed limit. World of Warcraft has a speed limit, you know, the Sims have a speed limit, and it depends on the um, resolution that that simulation is done to. What's the smallest unit of time and the smallest unit of space that they render? You see, that makes a constant, and our constant we call C, it's the speed of light, and that's as fast as anything can go. So then suddenly I had quantum mechanics and relativity explained from virtual reality concepts, virtual reality concepts came out of understanding consciousness. So it all worked together. So then I was back into the physics game again, and I started working on experiments and doing other things that would then validate these concepts. And those are out there now. So that's kind of a, a long story. I know I've taken a lot of time, but that's kind of how I got to where I am now. So. I'm back in the physics game uh, doing experiments, and I, uh, you know, have uh, put up, like I say, I got like 420, 450, I don't know, I've lost count, you know, somewhere between 400 and 500 videos are on YouTube, if your listeners want to find out more about it. Most of the science is actually on YouTube and not in the books, because the science became an aha moment for me after the books were published. I went back and added a little bit up to the books when I had to reprint them, but mostly the science is in the in the YouTube videos. So that's kind of where I am, and uh, I'm waiting for these experiments to get done. And uh, you know, I have a what's called a theory of everything because once you understand consciousness, you really understand consciousness. You understand everything else because everything else is derived from consciousness. That's the fundamental thing, and consciousness is a digital information system. Consciousness is about information. You see, everything, so look at our senses. We say we're conscious. Okay, you and I, we're conscious. We're sitting here having this, this talk over, over this electronic uh, wizardry. And what are, we, what are we conscious of? Well, we're conscious of just what our senses tell us, right? We're conscious of what we see, what we hear, what we feel. I'm sitting on a chair, you know, you don't see that chair, but I'm aware of that chair. I'm conscious of that chair because I have feeling, I'm conscious of smells and tastes and all that stuff. All that is is information. It's just information. Take away all the information and nothing. You're a point of consciousness floating in the, you know, uh, in, in the abyss, in, in a void. That's all you are. So consciousness is information. 
And our consciousness, our individual consciousness, consciousness, you know, of Matthew Belair and the consciousness of Tom Campbell are what I call individuated units of consciousness. We're pieces of that larger consciousness system. And there was a reason why the system created pieces, but we won't necessarily go there unless you want to go there. So anyhow, that's kind of in a nutshell of, you know, where I started and now where I am now and that it's a, it's really a, a fun place to be because everything that used to be difficult to understand, paranormal things, you know, well, how do people heal with their minds? You know, what is this remote viewing? How does that work? Uh, the placebo effect. How come a doctor, you know, gives you a story about sugar pills and it makes you, you know, physically better. You know, how does all that stuff work? Why is it like that? Uh, how is it that you can have precognitive dreams and understand about the future? You know, how does that work? Where does that come from? Uh, you know, why are we here? What's the point of our life? Where does happiness come from? All of those things become easy. All of those things become very easy to understand once you get consciousness and even physics gets easy to understand once you've got consciousness so i'm now on a on a search for things that i can understand i'm on a search for things that don't fit the theory that are somehow outside the theory because if that's the case then there's a couple of things that could happen one the theory could be expanded to include them or the theory needs to change it's not you know it's not as inclusive it's not as good as it ought to be or the theory's wrong. If I can't explain everything, then the theory isn't a theory of everything. It's only a theory, of, a theory of some things. And, you know, it needs to change. It needs to grow or it's wrong and you need to start over. But that's what science is about. It's about looking for things that you don't understand and trying to figure out, you know, how they work. So that's where I'm now. And I'm having a lot of fun uh, doing that. And I, I'm going to be in uh, Oregon and, and Washington and Vancouver, Canada, uh, next week and a week after, you know, doing some talks, talking to people. Uh, and a lot of those talks won't center so much around physics as they'll center about life. Because when you understand consciousness and your purpose here, then you also understand why people are struggling, why people have problems, why life is full of pain and, and uh, struggle and angst. And you can take, you can see all the root of that. So we tend to talk more about growing up and living in the larger reality, and you know how to approach life and that sort of thing as we do as we do physics. It all comes out of the same set of understandings. Okay, so I'll be quiet now. That's my uh, that's my uh, once over the the whole thing, and uh, we can just pick that apart in any way you like. Man, that was that was incredible. I would sit here and listen permanently. <laughs> I would there's I, I, the longer you want to go, I will sit and <laughs> and receive that information. It's really incredible stuff. My mind is you know just going all over the place as you're just saying each of these concepts. They're they're truly profound. It's 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 amazing stuff. So what I was thinking about is. is um, is you're talking about, you know, once we understand, you know, what is it about consciousness that we, we need to understand so that everything like in your research, you're like, you know, once we understand this level of consciousness, um, things become easy in your research. What, what are those things that we need to understand? And if you want to go when you, when you are on your amazing, incredible rant, uh, of, <laughs> of information and you talked about why we have individuated consciousness, I, I would love for you to explore that and, and talk about that. Um, and then just, just in case, because who knows which way this could go, um, eventually getting to, practical advice for um, how we can have out-of-body experiences. For me, um, I did a little bit of astral projection when I was younger. Um, lucid dreaming is something that I was able to do, uh, but it always took a bunch of practice. And you're at a whole nother level. You know, you're like the Michael Jordan of outer body experiences. <laughs> and I picked up a basketball and thrown it at a hoop. Um, that's kind of how I, I see the difference. And um, and then picking up the nature of reality, because if you're going out of body and you're experiencing a reality or a, or a, a different set of rule sets, mm -hmm. um, then it's, it changes the whole game when you come back to this rule set within the body, you know, and how you experience everything around you if you're going to these other realms. Um, 
So I don't know if I formulated one specific question, but you can kind of take that yeah. feedback and, and run wherever you'd like with all that. Okay. Okay. And if you, uh, you know, feel like I'm going on too long about some direction that you'd rather, you know, go someplace else, just interrupt, just jump in. That's all right. Perfect. I don't mind, you know, just jump in and say, well, hell, let's, let's go over here and, and think about this for a while. And that, that, that suits me fine because cool. you know, your audience better than I do. And you, are sort of your audience's spokesman. You know, you're speaking uh -huh. for your audience and you kind of have to keep me reined in to where your audience will find this useful and fun. Otherwise they won't stay your audience. So we need to make it good for them. So just kind of take me where you think your audience would like me to go. All right. Well, so I like I can... to always go as, uh, as deeply as possible, as, as, as deep down as, as that mind of yours is capable of going. That's, that's the realm I'd like to stay in. Yeah, well, that would take us probably the rest of the day. You know, when I, when, I do, when I do my workshops uh, where I basically do a, a, a shallow pass over all the, the basic concepts, I usually do that uh, in two full days, you know, all day Saturday and all day Sunday, two hours. That's like 16 hours. So we do like 16 hours of talk and we get kind of a shallow pass over all the concepts where I, I basically explain you know, all the basic ideas. And that's not really digging in real deep into anything. That's just going over all the ideas. The problem we have is that when you're talking about a theory of everything, you know, it's not like, well, tell me your theory of everything in 25 words or less. You know, you just, you just can't do that. There's an awful lot to talk about. I mean, you have to talk about everything. And uh, that makes it long. It's not something you can you can talk about, you know, even in a, you know, in a few hours. So we're going to skim along and jump along different subjects. I won't be able to derive anything because that would take time if you actually do logical derivations of things. But all of the material, all those derivations are in the YouTube and they're in the book. So anybody that gets interested in it, I guess at the outside, I tell you, if it looks like I'm just making stuff up and making a lot of assumptions, well, I can't help that because we don't have that much time together. But if you want to see the logic, if you want to hear the logic, if you want to say, uh-huh, right, yeah, okay, prove it to me, then you're going to have to go watch the videos and you're going to have to go read the books because it's in there that really is a logical derivation. There are no, you know, wild assumptions here. Actually, the whole thing, the whole my big toe uh, theory, including all the science, has just two fundamental Assumptions. One assumption is that consciousness exists. Not anything really about consciousness or what it is or how it works, just that consciousness is there. It exists, which isn't really too big a stretch since, you know, we're conscious and we think we're conscious, then it must exist. So that's not a real big leap of faith. And the second one is that uh, evolution exists. And evolution is, is that if you have a, a system that can change, that systems in an environment or has certain, uh, pressures pushing on it, then it will change in order to optimize itself relative to that environment or whatever the pressures are that it has to deal with. So that's not hard to figure out either. I mean, we look at that all around us. I mean, you know, everything evolves, right? Technology evolves, you know, it's not just we, the, you know, the critters and the, and the plants on the earth evolve I and mean, everything evolves, you know, economic systems evolve. It just changes. Things change based on the pressures that are pushing on them. All right, so that's not a big leap either. You know, none of those two assumptions are really too far out there, and that's it. From those two assumptions, everything else is a logical derivation, and I say a deductive logical derivation. It's all it's all logic after that, and it just takes a lot of time to go through that logic. So let's start where you where you said you'd like to start. Like, okay, we're individuated units of consciousness. You know, why are we here? You know, where do we come from? What's our purpose? How do we fit into this this uh, this picture? Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start with. I won't go back to the very beginning. It's a little too long, but let's just start with consciousness. So we have a thing called consciousness, and this consciousness. We just think of it as a, a monolithic thing. So what is consciousness? Consciousness makes choices. Consciousness is aware, right? It's, a, it's an awareness. It's self-aware. It knows that it is, and it can make choices. I would like to do this, or I'd like to do that. So it can 
make those choices. That's about all consciousness is. It has what I call a decision space, which are its choices. Now, you have a decision space and I have a decision space. And that for us, that's all the choices that we're aware of. So at this time, you know, your listeners, they have a choice. They can continue to listen or they can turn off their radio or turn off their computer or whatever it is they're listening on. You know, that's a choice they have. So you have choices and all the choices that you know you have make up your decision space. That's your choice space. You can choose maybe one of 10 things. Okay, here's something happened. You know, what am I going to do? How am I going to feel? What does this mean to me? And there's certain choices that you get to make. But there's probably twice as many choices that you have kind of theoretically, because a lot of your choices you don't even know about. And the reason you don't know about them is generally because you have beliefs. You believe that life and reality is this way. Therefore, all your choices just fall within those bounds of what you believe. And you have fears and fears will limit your choices. Some choices you just can't go there because that's scary. So that's, you know, you're not going to walk into that haunted house because that's just too scary. So now your choice of going in there and looking around is gone because you have fear. So you won't make that choice. Anyway, we have this, this uh, monolithic, uh, individ this monolithic uh, consciousness system. Okay, consciousness we said is information. So it's an information system. Consciousness needs memory. Okay, consciousness needs processing. Consciousness needs uh, feedback, which means it can learn. That is, you do something, that something has consequences, that something, you know, you can look at it and you can say, well, was that a good thing or a bad thing? You know, did that help me or did that hurt me? And then you can learn from that. If it was a bad thing, then you try to avoid that. You know, if it turned out to be good, you try to do more of that. So that's the feedback. So you've got a feedback system. So we have memory, processing, we have feedback, and the last thing we need is, is we need some sort of purpose, something that drives us. Remember, we talked about you evolve in an environment with pressures, right, with, with uh, constraints, okay? Well, in our system, in our biological evolution, th those constraints are procreation and survival, right? Those are the things. If you can procreate and survive, then you continue on. You get to keep going. If you can't do either one of those well, well, then you become extinct and you disappear. So our evolution in biology is all about survival and procreation. Those are our, you know, our, uh, our, our constraints, I guess I should say. Well, this consciousness system is an information system. It's not about eating and, you know, and, and uh, outside environments. It's mostly about an inside environment. It is information. It makes choices. Now, information is order information requires structure okay let's think of a bunch of bits bits just being a one and a zero if we're talking about binary bits this conscious doesn't have to be binary but binary is just a good model for us to talk about because we understand that so we'll talk about binary bits ones and zeros if you have a lot of bits but all the bits are just random then there is no information just a bunch of random ones and zeros don't tell you anything Okay, now if you give those bits structure, now those bits can have meaning. That's information. If you give them structure, you give them order, that's information. And information is embedded in structure itself. For instance, if I go up, down, up, down, what's next? Up, right? Because I went up, down, up, down. Well, the next thing is up. Well, how did you know the next thing was up? Oh, well, there's information in that pattern. You see, you can make predictions, predictions based on that information in the pattern. So just structure itself, patterns, uh, collections of things, that uh, creates information. All right, so we have an information system, consciousness. It can think, it's self-aware. Um, if it, if it de-evolves, that means it loses its structure. It loses information. It's an information system. If it evolves, there's more content, there's more structure, there's more organization. There's a term, a physics term that measures organization and structure. It's called entropy. If you have a lot of entropy, that means you have a lot of randomness. 
you have the highest entropy possible in a system, there's nothing but random bits in it. If you have structure, then there is some information in it and the entropy now is reduced. So low entropy means more organization. High entropy means less organization. Now, the environment then for a consciousness system to evolve or de-evolve isn't procreation and survival, it's lowering entropy. Because lowering entropy means more information, more meaning, more content of the information, more choices for the consciousness to make. Okay, so we have a system and it communicates with, it can think, communicates with itself, let's say. It can think, it can do things. It can make patterns. It can say, all right, I feel this way or I feel that way. All right, this and that can be a one and a zero. Now I can feel this way, this way, this way, then that way and that way. Well, that was four this is and three that's. Now I've got a, you know, I got a, a you know, a binary language going on here, ones and zeros, right? So the system can develop its own information just from what little bit, you know, all it has to do is be able to be in one state or another, and it's got binary. And then it can do that to make binaries in any order it wants. So it evolves. It evolves from the simple state of just a binary this way, that way kind of thing into patterns, into patterns of patterns. And then eventually it realizes that it can be aware of change. It was before the pattern and after the pattern. Well, it's got time. Now it has time to work with, but time isn't useful really so much until you, you make regular time. Well, it can make regular time. It's like a technology. It evolves. And that is, it can change those two states, this state versus that state, a one and a zero. Well, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. That's a metronome. That's time. You see, that's a clock. So now it has a clock and oh, now look, I don't only have patterns. I can have sequences of patterns, of patterns, of sequences. You see, it can get more and more complex. The more complex it gets, the lower the entropy is. Complexity means more order, more structure, you see? So what it's, it's doing, it's evolving. That's its evolution. Consciousness evolves, information systems evolve by lowering their entropy, okay? So this system now is trying to lower its entropy because if it doesn't, its entropy will increase. Entropy just does that. If you don't put any energy in, entropy starts to increase. It works that way everywhere, including consciousness. If you never put any maintenance into your home, your house eventually will rot and fall down. You need to continually put energy in, otherwise things Go to hell in a handbasket, right? They fall apart, they decay, they uh, lose structure. When something decays, it's just losing structure. It used to be a nice structured piece of wood, but now it rots, it's just mush. It no longer has the, you know, the structure that it had. It doesn't have the order that it had. So everything is based on, on order and entropy. So this system now has gotten to about as far as it can get with patterns and patterns and sequences of patterns and so on, and it's kind of topped out. It needs another new technology. Okay, time was a real big step forward. That was a new technology that it could invent. Its next big technology is something that really comes natural to systems. We do it here in our biology. And that is if you have two systems that can interact with each other and each system has free will, then what comes out of that interaction is unknown. You don't know, you know, because one thing feeds in another. This one does this, that causes the other one to do something else, which causes the first one to do something else. And if you have a lot of these things interacting with each other, then the possibilities of order and, you know, where you, what you can construct and build out of that go up because you've created a lot of novelty. So that's why the system created individuated units of consciousness, because as a monolithic thing, it could only evolve so far. As a multiplexed thing, there's a lot more evolution, a lot more possibilities. Now we do that with our cells, right? We started with bacteria and that was it, one-celled critters. That's all we had here is one-celled critters. Well, they lowered their entropy by cooperating with each other, making multi-celled critters. And then those multi-celled critters went up another level of organization and cooperation to multi-celled critters with cell differentiation. That means you had the 
you know, the digestion part, you know, the locomotion part, you had the, the control part, all of these various parts of organs and, and subsets of a thing. Now we're bunches of cooperating subsets of cells that were all cooperating with each other within their subsets. So all that is, is a higher level of organization, a lower level of entropy. And then we look at our own evolution of survival and procreation, and you realize at the base of that, all that is, is entropy reduction too. That survival and procreation is really a lower entropy state within, you know, within the, uh, you know, within the system that it's in, our system of biology. It's a lower state. When you get along with your environment, that is a lower entropy state than if you're struggling and fighting with your environment. You see? So that's what consciousness is. It's an information system that's trying to survive by lowering its entropy. And that's its strategy is to create us, pieces of itself that will interact with each other and with it. And now you have these tens of thousands, millions, and billions of things that are all interacting with each other. Hard to tell where that thing might go. You see, now it's a whole different idea, a whole different thing. So that's why we have individuated units of consciousness like you and I. All right, now these consciousnesses, what they do is they communicate. They're, they are aware, right? They're conscious. But basically all they do is send information back and forth. It's an information system. So that's limiting. How do you grow with that? How do you, uh, how do you uh, lower your entropy when all you do is talk to each other? Well, you know, talking to each other was good for a while, a lot of ideas there, you know, but uh, now you're just talking to each other. So your entropy reduction kind of slows down a little bit again. You start to top out with that. And you constantly have to be putting energy in to keep this thing from de-evolving. So what the system realized is that there just wasn't enough consequences to the conversation. Think of it, uh, think of it as a big chat room. You have a big chat room, you know, with a million people in the chat room, no rules. You all just talk to each other. Well, what are you going to learn from that? You see, it's real hard to learn from that. There's not enough structure. There's not enough constraints. There's not enough feedback and there's not enough consequences. You can say anything you want. So what? You know, you're just this individual unit of conscious. You can say whatever you want, however you want, to whomever you want, and there's no consequences. So what they needed was another frame of existence, another reality frame that had consequences. What that means is it had a much tighter rule set to where just communicating wasn't the thing. You had, when you communicated, that made the change, that changed things and you get results from that. And then you have to live with the results from that. So we wanted a tight rule set where energy exchanges were well-defined and they this system created a reality frame for its members to play in. Now, how did it do that? Well, it's an evolving system. Now, this is just a natural system I'm talking about. It's just an information system, just a natural, it's not a supernatural system, just a natural system trying to survive. Okay, so it says, let's create a virtual reality that we can log into as consciousness and have more structure interactive, right? More consequences. So it starts with an initial conditions and a rule set. That's what makes a virtual reality, initial conditions and a rule set. The rule set tells how, how this communication will work. What are the interchanges of energy within the system? So it does that and then it lets that system evolve. Well, that system probably didn't work out very well, so it probably changed some of the rules and changed some of the initial conditions and tried it again. It's all evolution. Eventually, it evolved a system that is our system, okay? It evolved a simulation that is our universe. Our universe is a virtual reality. This body is an avatar. You and I are two avatars. We're talking to each other. You see, now when people hear that, they say, well, that's crazy, you know, this, that we're avatars, you know, but here's the idea. Okay, let's say, let's, let me, let's talk about a virtual reality for a while. Let's talk about uh, World of Warcraft. Okay, that's a lot. Everybody knows that, I guess. It's been around a long, long time, or The Sims, either one. Okay, let's say you're, that we're talking about World of Warcraft. Now, 
here's way virtual reality works. Virtual reality is is uh, has, has some some properties that are true of all virtual realities, no matter how they come about or where they are. All virtual realities have this property, and that is you really have only two active elements to a virtual reality, and that's the computer and the player. The computer and the player are basically just exchanging information back and forth. Right? That's all that's really going on is a computer that computes the virtual reality and the player that's playing it, and they just keep sending information back and forth between them. That's really all that's going on there. But the computer computes this virtual world, and the player plays an avatar in that virtual world. Okay. Now, let's say that avatar is an elf. I'm playing World of Warcraft, and I've got an elf wizard. I don't know if there's elf wizards in that or not, but I'm making this up. So we have an elf wizard, and I'm playing this elf wizard. Now, I am that elf wizard's consciousness. You see, that elf wizard, my avatar, doesn't do anything if I don't tell it to do it. If I don't give it any instructions, it just sits there and wobbles. Doesn't do anything at all. I say jump, or I say you know kneel, I say run, I say fight. It does all those things, but if I don't say anything, it doesn't do anything. I am its consciousness. I'm making all of its choices. So I'm the consciousness. Now, the server is creating that game. Okay, It creates that elf, those rivers, that rocks, those buildings, all the thing that's in that world of Warcraft, the computer creates those. And it creates them in terms of information. And it sends me, I'm the player, it sends me a data stream. That data stream goes onto my computer and it's just a bunch of pixels. That data stream is nothing more than lighting up, you know, six million pixels, each one with an intensity, a color, you know, and a position. That's it. So I got all this array of little lights that I look at. And when I look at that array of little lights, I say, oh, look, there's a stream, there's a tree, you know, there's my elf, you know, my elf has a sword. I get all that from that array of lights. So I take the data stream and I interpret it to be that reality. Okay. Now, from the elf's perspective, okay, if inside the virtual reality, from the elf's perspective, its consciousness, its player has to be non-physical to the elf, right? The player who's playing the elf can't be inside the virtual reality. It has to be outside the virtual reality. The computer computing that virtual reality can't exist inside the virtual reality. It can't be a virtual computer that's computing its own virtual reality. That doesn't make any sense. It has to be outside the virtual reality. And of course, that's the way we find it. You know, we, There's a server someplace, and it's in the same reality we are. We're the player, and we have this virtual game going on, and we are the consciousness for that elf. All right, now bring that to us. We work the same way. So here we are with our bodies, and we're talking to each other. We see each other's bodies, and those are our avatars. We are consciousness. Our consciousness can't be in this reality. It has to be non-physical to us somewhere else. The computer can't be in our reality. It has to be somewhere else. Well, that's true. Our consciousness, that's that individuated unit of consciousness, it's non-physical to us. That computer, that's the larger consciousness system, that's non-physical to us. But here we are. Now, what's the difference here? Well, there's two differences between World of Warcraft and our reality. One difference is that when you play World of Warcraft, anytime you uh, feel like it, you can put it on pause, get up, uh, you know, make yourself some lunch, you know, take a take a nature break, and then come back, sit down, and take it off a of pause and play some more. Right? You're not engaged in the game. You're not immersed in the game 100%. You're only immersed in it. You know, you may feel like 100% right when you're in the heat of the battle. You know, you're not aware of anything else going on. But then you can always withdraw from it and put it on pause. Well, the way it works is that we are 100% emerged in this virtual reality game. When we log on, everything we experience is what our avatar experiences. So that would be like if you were glued to your to your computer, you didn't have to eat. You didn't have to pee. You didn't have to get up. You didn't get tired. You didn't have to sleep. You were just in there all the time, 100% of your time. The only thing you experienced was through your avatar. Well, what happens is when you're in that 100% immersive game, you begin to think you are the avatar because the only thing you experience is what that avatar experiences. 
See, you're its consciousness. You make the choices, but it does the stuff. It's the thing that's doing. So we, you would begin to think that you were that avatar if you weren't aware of, had no input from anything else but that game. Well, that's what happens to us. We begin to believe we are this avatar, you see? And we don't, we're not aware of anything else other than what this, this avatar experiences. So we are consciousness. We're non-physical. The larger consciousness system is non-physical to us. These bodies are avatars. We're playing in a game that is made up of rules. It's a rule set. You know, World of Warcraft has a rule set. Your elf can't fly. Well, at least my elf never could fly. Elves can't fly. They got to run to get to where they're going. You see, they can maybe hop on the back of some other critter, but they have, you know, they can't fly. Well, that's part of the rules. And no matter how much you tell your elf to flap his arms, he's not going to fly because the rule set doesn't support it. Well, here in this reality, I can't, you know, uh, jump 10 feet in the air. If I run into a 10 foot wall, I got to get a ladder or I need ropes. I need something because I can't jump over it because that's not in the rule set. The rule set says I'm too heavy. My legs don't have enough muscle. I can't propel myself over a 10 foot wall. Rule set doesn't allow it, you see. So there's rules in the rule set. So now if somebody hits me in the head with an iron pipe, you know, some mugger jumps out from behind a bush, hits me in the head and gives me brain damage. That's just another constraint that my player has to play with. You see, my elf's like that. If my elf falls off a cliff or gets hurt in a battle, well, his hit points go down. I just have to play him wounded. I have to play him sick. I can't do all the things I used to do. All right, well, it's the same here. I get hit in the head and maybe I slur my speech and drag my left foot when I walk now because I've got damaged in my brain it's a virtual brain it's just part of the rule set you see and the rule set says that okay that part's dysfunctional now my consciousness has to work with an avatar that slurs its words and drags its left foot and it now has a different set of choices it can't run marathons anymore you see it can't do other things that it used to do so we are just like that so if you think about consciousness being information that this is a virtual reality your body is an avatar, you are the consciousness, and you are here in order to what? Lower your entropy, right? That's the thing that pushes the whole game. You're here to lower entropy. So we're here, what's that mean to us? That means it's about building, structure, organization, right? That's the low entropy. And look at a social system. If you look at social systems, you'll see how do you optimize a social system for low entropy? And what happens to a social system when you de-optimize it, when it goes to high entropy? Easy to tell. You have a whole bunch of, let, let's just do a little uh, thought experiment. I'm gonna have a whole bunch of people, and I'm gonna call this the, the, uh, the, the love experiment. I'm gonna a whole bunch of people here, and they are going to, just interact. I'll give them a certain amount of resources, certain number of people, 10,000 people. Here's the resources. Here's your environment. Go do something. Well, if these people are caring, if it's about other, if they care about others, you see, it's not all about them. They're not self-centered. They're about what can we do together? How can we work together? How can we build together? Well, that group of people will cooperate with each other will care about each other, will take care of each other, and they will optimize what they can produce with those people and those resources. They'll optimize it, okay? Now we'll take the fear group, the fear experiment. Same number of people, exact same kinds of people, you know, identical to the first group, same resources, but this is gonna be the fear group. The fear group is very self-centered. It's all about me. Of these resources, how much of these resources can I grab for me? and for mine, for, you know, for my people, and how am I gonna keep them? That's their problem. How can they get them and how can they keep them? You see, and if somebody comes up with a good idea, well, they keep it to themselves because they can sell that idea or they can use it to their own advantage. They're not gonna share it with other people, you see. And eventually what happens in this fear group is that, of course, there's no trust. Where there's self-centeredness and where there's fear, there's very little trust. Everybody's out for themselves. If anybody builds something up, other people want to take it away from them and tear it down. Um, eventually, anything built up will get torn down. 
Somebody else will build it up and then somebody else will tear that down. And what you have is then they will group up into packs, into groups of mutual defense groups, right? Hey, hey let, us, let us get together and together we can grab more stuff and we can protect each other so that other people don't get, you know, grab our stuff. And then these other groups will, other people will group up to be a group against that group and so on. And pretty soon you'll end up with, you know, 5% of the people owning, you know, 95% of the stuff, wars going on between the groups all the time, uh, no trust, no caring, no cooperation, self-centered, and that's that group. Now, that is not a low entropy group. That's a high entropy group. You see, it's very dysfunctional, and they will not optimize everything that they could have for that group, you know, with those resources. It'll be very dysfunctional. And of course, we recognize that fear group, don't we? That's us. <laughs> that's the way we live. That's our environment. That's our nation states. You know, that's, that's our self-centered people. That's what we have here. Okay. So what is it that these, so in a social group like this, which we call consciousness system and all of the individual units of consciousness make a social group, right? They're, they're beings, they're self, self-aware beings that interact with each other. Well, how can they lower their entropy? by cooperation, by caring, by working for each other. You see, that's how you optimize. That's how you lower entropy. That's how the system survives. That's how it evolves, by lowering entropy. So why are we here? We're here to make choices that are love-based choices, cooperative choices, caring choices. That's what we're here for. And it was hard to learn in that big chat room because there weren't any consequences. So we made this virtual reality for us to play in this game where there's lots of consequences and where we help create our future. We create our future here. And we have to live in the, whatever mess we make, we have to live in it. That's part of our feedback, you see. So that's what we're doing here. We're supposed to make choices that help us evolve the quality of our consciousness toward love, which is saying we want to evolve toward lower entropy, which is another way of saying that is spiritual growth. Another way of saying that is, you know, we just uh, increase our quality, grow up. That's what we're here for. And that's our point. And we have been doing this slowly. If you look back three, four, 500 years even, you'll see that it was a pretty rough place and there wasn't a lot of caring or cooperation. It was all gimme and greed. Well, we still have a lot of gimme and greed, but we've come a long way, baby, you know, since those 500 years ago or a thousand years ago, um, we are much better now than we were and we are evolving and we will eventually get there. We will eventually become cooperative and caring it may take another couple of millennia, you know, we don't know just how soon this will happen, but we hope not. I think there's some things that are going on, and we can talk about this later, that's going to push this process of growing up into high gear shortly, within the next couple of decades. And that could be an interesting discussion to have, but I believe that's where we're going. Okay, so now that gets us to why do we exist? Because that's on the process of lowering the entropy of the system, which is on the process of survival and you know continued evolution of the system, because otherwise de-evolution is all the bits are random. Okay, and what is our purpose? Our purpose is to grow up, to become love, to make choices of cooperation and caring, not choices of fear and you know gimme and greed. So that's what we're doing here. And that's you know, that's the game that we're in. Now, another interesting thing is that this is not the only game. Larger consciousness system has lots of virtual realities. All realities, and I'm saying a reality frame is something in which you can experience. That's a reality frame. The very first reality frame, the very first virtual reality were the communication protocols that the system made so these individuated units of consciousness could talk to each other. That was a rule set. Those communication protocols are, are rule set. Okay, and first you need language, and that language was developed first virtual reality. When you when your avatar dies, okay, we talk about death for a little bit. When your avatar dies, means your body dies. It's just like your elf dying. 
what happens when your elf dies? Well, you got two choices. You go get another character to play or you go resurrect that character, right? That's it. And then you get back in the game. Okay. Well, that's the same thing we do. You know, we have to go get another character to play to get back in the game. If we want to get back in the game, you know, we have free will choice, get back in the game if we want to. So that's the same thing here. So there is another virtual reality called the transition reality, which just helps those individuated units of consciousness that have been immersed with this one avatar for a long time to kind of reorient themselves to being individuated units of consciousness, you know, playing a game and, and get them to help uh, understand the choices they made and were they good choices or bad choices and did they evolve or did they de-evolve and get them set up maybe to try again, you see. So that's another virtual reality, different than this one. When you dream, that's another virtual reality. Why do we have dreams? Because we work, work, work all day, all night. That's our job is to grow up here. So we make choices here. And then when we're, our body is kind of rebuilding itself and getting rid of the, you know, taking out the trash while we sleep, then we still work. But we work in a different reality frame with a different rule set. But we're doing the same thing. We're making choices. And by those choices we make in our dreams, we evolve or we de-evolve the quality of our consciousness. It's just another reality we play in, you see? And when you go out of body, oh, you're in another reality frame. What do you do there? You make choices. You make choices, you evolve, you de-evolve by the quality of those choices you make. It's like that all over. Now, there are reality frames that have tight rule sets like our physical universe reality, virtual reality, and there's dozens of those. I've been to many of those different reality frames. And those I call, you know, just tight rule sets. Everything, every energy change is defined in detail. You go to like the transition reality, the dream reality, those rule sets aren't so tight. In the dream reality, I can jump over a 10 foot fence. I can fly if I want, I can teleport. I can do all those things in a dream reality because the rule set isn't that tight. It's got a much looser rule set. Transition reality, has even less than a dream reality. It doesn't have a lot of rules. It's just got a very specific purpose and it has just enough rules to work that purpose and that's all it needs. So there's literally hundreds of virtual realities that we can play in if we wish, but most of us are just kind of trapped here in this, this physical universe, virtual reality, because we are immersed in it. Okay, but we are consciousness, you see. We are consciousness. So though we can't, you know, you know, we can't um, take our avatar with us into some other reality, but that doesn't mean we can't take our consciousness into some other reality. We are a piece of that larger consciousness system, and we can travel around in that and do what it does. And, you know, we have a much bigger reality to live in than just this virtual reality that we're logged into. It'd be like playing a game of Sims and your Sim character finds a doorway that it goes through. And when it goes through that doorway, it comes out in the world of Warcraft. So, you know, it's Sim character he walks through the door and there he is and there's elves and goblins and demons and things, you know, berserkers and things all over the place. And, uh, you know, he's in a different reality frame now. Okay, well, that's the way it is, you see. He's still a Sims character. He's still a Sims character and he still has to function by the rules in the Sims game, but he's in another reality frame. Well, that's the way it is for us. What has he done? What he's done is he's getting a data stream that defines the Sims, right? You're getting a data stream that defines the Sims reality. Now he's let that reality, let that data stream go. He's attached to another data stream that defines World of Warcraft. It's just switching data streams and he can do both data streams where they go together, where he walks through a door and Sims and comes out into the world of Warcraft. You see, now they're both. We can do the same thing. We can shift our awareness to a different data stream. And that's what going out of body is all about. That's what remote viewing is all about. That's what, you know, you do when you meditate. When you meditate, you let go of this data stream. Your meditation should take you to a point called point consciousness, where you are just a point of consciousness floating in the void. You're just a point of awareness 
the only thing you know is I am. You know, you just you exist, but there's nothing else. You're floating in this black void. That's point consciousness. That's the doorway. From there, your intent can hook you up to multiple data streams. So the reason that you have problems going out of body, and that's a hard thing for people to do, getting into these other reality frames, is because you make it hard. You believe it's hard. You believe that this process of going someplace else has to go through a barrier. It's some, it's some real complex, difficult process. All you do is shift your attention to a different data stream. All these virtual realities are nothing but data streams. And you can do that in a tenth of a second. You don't need to lie down. You don't need to close your eyes. You don't need to even get in a meditation state first. You don't have to do anything. You can just shift your attention to another data stream. And there you are in that other reality frame. Or you can shift only half of your attention to another data stream. Now you're half and half in two reality streams. You're working both you know, in both streams. It's sort of like watching two football games in picture within a picture on your digital TV set. Okay, you got two different games going on and you're watching them both. You're keeping up with both of them. You know what the score is both places and so on. But you can only spread yourself so thin. If you, have, if you had to watch 20 different football games at once, you probably wouldn't do a very good job keeping up with them all. They'd just be too much. And I found that too. You know, it's easy to do two. It's not that hard to do three. Four is a little bit of trouble. Anything over four starts to fall apart because what you're doing is you are par you're not really parallel processing. You're time sharing. You're spending a little bit of attention here and a little bit of attention there. You're still just one consciousness. You're just going out and sampling different data streams. If you sample them fast enough, then it's just like being there in those two data streams. So that's all out of body is so we've talked a little bit about it. i'm trying to hit all your points that you that you made that's that's what out of body is it's a lot simpler than you think out of body isn't as big a deal but because we have some fear some intrepidation we don't know we're worried about uh, we don't want to trick ourselves we don't want to just get in our imagination we want it to be real we have a lot of concerns. We have this belief you have to go through some kind of cloudy, foggy, foggy state and then emerge on the other side. You don't have to do any of that. Um, all of that is our beliefs. And all of those beliefs make it very hard for us to actually do it. Uh, the harder we want to try, the harder we try, the more we're working from our intellect. We work from our intellect. It doesn't work. It's not an intellectual thing. You don't go out of body with your intellect. You have to go out of body at the being level, at the core of you, not you know, not from your intent at the, at the intellectual intent. It has to be a deeper level intent than that. When you, I'm trying to give a little perspective before we kind of pick a rabbit hole. I've opened up a whole lot of rabbit holes now. Well, I've yeah, opened I'll, up a few more. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah, jump I'll give in. You, yeah, I'll, I'll give you like a, <laughs> a little break. Man, I again, I could just sit here and listen all day. It's so incredible what you're sharing and and just the insights you're giving, it's just one massively deep, incredible concept after another. So this is where I wanted to just touch base on on how I'm understanding everything that you're talking about. Um, the video game concept, super interesting. I have a, a friend of mine who lost his memory uh, by getting hit by a car. Uh, there's a guy, a course that I do, his name's Core Love. He had the same experience where he lost all his memory as a kid. And um, DMT would activate through seizures uh, as, as a 10-year-old and would go to realms of gods and goddesses and he would communicate with them. And then he would come back and he would be in his body and explain it to his parents. And they're just like, we don't know what you're talking about crazy so he stopped talking about it but he kept having the seizures dmt would activate he would go to the realms and come back this happened over and over and over again and both him and my friend julian say the same thing because julian had lost all his memory he needed to get it back and he talked about everything as memory and accessing different states and, and being able to access his memory and then building from you know that access point because if you don't have any memory then you're just kind of floating around and and you you don't have any anchor point um so you know with everything that you're saying one thing that comes up and i'm curious about and i really want to get into you know practical uh, out-of-body experience um, techniques and processes. 
But, uh, you know, like what is your take on the ascended masters, people like Jesus or Buddha or even Yogananda recently who can do these things? And you're, you know, you're, you're pushing it yourself, being able to access these different uh, realms. And, and you hear these speakers talk about this, you know, these incredible, if you read the autobiography of a yogi, his master comes and he appears as an orb, as a, as a being of light. And, and then he explains how that's possible in this reality. He explains a little bit about the next reality as you're phrasing it as the transition reality. Um, so the autobiography of a yogi talks about that consistently. And I'm reading uh, uh, Life and Teachings of the Masters of the Far East, same thing. And they're talking about it. And when they write about it, it seems to make sense. It resonates. It's beyond capacity. Like you said, you need to experience it. Once you experience mm -hmm. it, then this reality doesn't become the only reality. Now you know experientially that there are multiple realities. So as you've opened up so many wonderful rabbit holes, I just wanted to add uh, a question in there is, uh, you know, from everything that you're, you've experienced and learned, how can we take practical tools to expand and give us more freedom, more awareness to hack, like essentially hack our uh, reality? I kind of see it as like Neo from the Matrix. We have these rule sets. Um, some of them can be bent. Some of them can be broken. And so we're we're talking about these incredible concepts and then a lot of people got to go to work or a lot of people are at work and like wow this is amazing like how can i just get rid of this stuff that i don't want you know tune into this higher level of consciousness to create more freedoms and more options and that's what awareness does that's what meditation does that's what um yeah, expanding your consciousness does you know you go from one choice you know, going to your job and making money and paying your bills to, boom, now you have two choices, then you have four choices, then you have eight, then 16. And then from there, you navigate the center point, kind of like your realm. So um, I guess I just wanted to ask and, and throw that at you about, you know, practically expanding, giving yourself more options, your view on Ascended Masters, is that a capability? Do we have, are they people like that kind of hacked the matrix and just showed us that that was possible, like a couple of Neos dropping into the video game? Um, and then moving into, you know, your, your rabbit holes that you were going to dive into. Okay. Um, sure. We'll talk about that. These ideas have been around for a long time, right? Uh, I talk about a virtual reality. 2,500 years ago, the Buddha talked about this reality being an illusion, right? Everything is maya, everything's an illusion. Well, that's just another way of saying it's a virtual reality. It is an illusion, you know? You're, the elf that you play, the Sims character you play is an illusion. It's not, it's not real. The only thing real is the consciousness. Consciousness is real. Okay, so the ideas have been around for a very, very long time because in order to understand these ideas, in order to realize that you're living in a virtual reality, or as Buddha said, in an illusion, and that love is really what matters, caring, it's, it's the interaction that, that, that is important, all you need to do is get, you know, do a little, um, instead of, uh, you know, exploring the outside world, explore the inside world a little bit. And that's what these masters did. They explored the inside world. When you explore that inside world, all of what I'm telling you is there. All of that is experience that you can have. And the more you experiment and the more you experience in that world, the more you live there. The more you learn, the, the more you grow, the bigger your decision space gets. Just like you say, you have one choice, couple of choices, more choices that keep expanding. That's your decision space. As your reality grows, your decision space grows. So some people live in a very small reality, a very little reality. Let's say uh, we can find somebody that uh, has never been more than 100 miles away from where they were born. They probably live in a very small reality. Take away their TV, their radio, and their newspapers, and they live even in a smaller reality. And that's the way people lived in just a couple of hundred years ago, live in very small realities. Well, when you live in a little reality, you have smaller choices, so a smaller decision space. As you grow up, your decision space grows, your reality grows. And I talked about you can parallel process multiple realities. Well, as you grow up, you live in a bigger reality. It's not like you live in this reality we call our physical universe, and sometimes you go into other realities, it's like you live in a bigger reality that contains multiple realities. And that's just the way you live. So every day, 
every minute of every day, yes, you can function here, you can carry on conversations and talk, but you're also processing information in other data streams, other realities. So you, you live in the bigger picture. So it's not a matter of just going to some other place sometimes. It really is a matter of becoming a, a citizen of a larger universe, not just this physical universe, but of something much bigger than this physical universe. And these masters you talk about are people who did that. And like, like I say, you know, 2,500 years ago, people did that because all you really need is what's inside. It's your exploration on the inside that delivers that to you. You don't need technology. You don't need anything on the outside. So people have always been able to find that. And there's always been people who have found that, who have spent their time exploring inner space. And they have come to similar conclusions. That's why you can read, you know, from the time writing was around, you know, up to now, there are people around who are doing that, who have done that. And sometimes they share it with other people. And other people uh, learn, you know, Buddha had a little following that walked around and with him. And many of those people attained what they called enlightenment, where that means they just saw a bigger picture. They just started living in a bigger picture with a bigger decision space. So yes, there are people like that. And you get there just by growing up. And how, you know, the, the way, you know, I guess the, I should say there are steps, there are things you need to do to get there. The basic thing you have to do is get rid of your fear. You see, we are constrained by our fear. Our fear creates ego. Our fear creates beliefs. So we have fear creating ego and beliefs, and those things are like a wall that we build around ourselves. They shut down our choices. So that's what keeps you and everybody else, I don't mean you specifically, but you know, you plurally, you know, that's what keeps people from being ascended masters is because they have fear, ego, and beliefs. That's what makes it difficult for people to go out of body. It's the fear, the ego, and the beliefs. If you get rid of those, then you just naturally grow up. You start living in a bigger picture. You see things. And when you do, you begin to realize things like why you're here. You know, ask the Buddha, why was he here? Well, he was here to love, to care, to give, to help. That's why he was here. Yeah, well, what's that? Lowering entropy. He's here to help lower the entropy, right? So people find that out. And when they find that out, then, you know, they have a higher quality of consciousness. They are evolving themselves and they tend to want to help other people do the same. So you do have ascended masters and you call them ascended, I guess, because they're dead, right? Doesn't, isn't that what makes them ascended or they ascended while they're here? I'm not sure how the word ascended is used, but in any case, you know, they're connected at a higher level, right? And uh, that's natural. Everybody can do that. Everybody can be that. It's not like they're special beings that uh, were just sent here to do that and us normal people can't. Anybody can do that. You just have to grow up. Matter of fact, that's what we're supposed to be doing here. That's kind of your model, if you like. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to understanding that love is our goal. Caring, if it's not about us. You see, and when we do that, we just live in a bigger world. And again, it's not that you live in this world and go to those bigger worlds sometimes. You live in a bigger world that concludes, that includes multiple reality frames all the time. For instance, somebody comes to me and says, Oh, my Aunt Susie uh, just got bad news of, you know, she has cancer of the gallbladder or something. Uh, you know, would you help her out? And goes on to tell me about Aunt Susie and what a wonderful person she is and yada, yada, yada. But, but after the first 10 words they told me, I already was with Aunt Susie. I'm already seeing what her health issues were and why they were and kind of the circumstances around that and you know how severe the cancer is and really if I should help or should I let it alone? And if I should help, then I'm start working on her before you know the person talking to me gets very far. I've already done that because I'm plugged into both of these, you know, to multiple realities. I can work with Aunt Susie and hold a conversation at the same time. That's just natural. It's not like that's a, it's not like that is a, a big deal. It's not like I do that and somehow I do this other thing 
it's just as part of a bigger reality. You live in a bigger space. So it's not a, you know, it's not a, it's not a thing that you do. It's a thing that you are. It's a mm -hmm. matter of being, not a matter of doing. So it's not that I have to arrange that or anything. It's just all available. And you live in that space all the time. So that's just an example, you know, but so everybody well, I was, I was gonna, can do that. I, I, yeah, I was just going to say, uh, I like that the point there is is what you're saying is that we all have the ability to do it. And so, yes. you know, Jesus said that, Buddha said that, all of them said yoga. And all of them are saying that. It's like what we have done, everybody can do. We We did it and we're showing you how we did it. You know, it's right. not, and you're saying the exact same thing. Yeah. The it's key like, is get rid of your fear. That's the key. Get rid of your fear. When you get rid of your fear, the ego and the beliefs go away. And once that goes away, you've taken the walls down. Now you just have to look around and see what is and learn to live in it. You know, it's, um, you know, I guess it'd be like uh, if you were in a prison, you were born in a prison and you've been in a prison all your life and you've never been out of your cell, you see? And that cell is basically your fear, your ego, and your beliefs. You're living in this cell. And if you can give that up, your cell disappears. And now you're just out in the rest of the whole world. And all you have to do is learn how to live in it. You see, it's not, uh, it's not really magic. You just have to get the cell to go away. But most of us are trapped with our fear and with our, our egos and with our beliefs. And that's what constrains us. So it's, it's that... You know, it's that easy conceptually. Of course, it's not that easy practically. Getting rid of fear is not a trivial thing. Um, here's a good way to go about it, though. I can give you a little bit of a, a, you know, a process for finding that fear and getting rid of it. Fear is hard to find because we take those fears and we stick them under the rug so we don't have to deal with them. So they're hard to see because our intellect, one, is ignoring them on purpose. And secondly, we've got them hidden real well under that rug, so they're really hard to find. Our beliefs are the same way. Beliefs are really hard to find because once we believe it, that's just the way it is. That's part of our reality. Anything outside of it just either doesn't exist or it's an anomalous point or we just toss it off. You know, we, it's not there. So beliefs are hard to see because whatever we believe to us, that's just non-questionable truth. That's just the way it is. You see, things are that way. Well. So beliefs are hard to find, but ego is easy. We can find ego anytime, very easily. How do you find ego? Anything in your life, anytime you feel negativity, stress, anxiety, anger, dislike, um, you know, all those negative things, all the negative feelings, you know, jealousy, Contempt, you know, we go through, we could probably list a hundred of them, you know, all the things that are on the negative side, all the things that aren't peace and love and caring and cooperation. Anytime you feel anything negative, anytime you get upset, anytime you become annoyed, that's ego. If you didn't have that ego, you wouldn't be annoyed, upset, or angry. That's ego. Okay, now that ego is attached to fear. You don't have that ego just because ego, you know, jumped on you one day. You have that ego because you have fear. So once you find the ego, you can find the fear that creates that ego. So if you get angry, you need to stop and say, what's pushing that? Why am I angry? And immediately, of course, you'll blame somebody else. So oh, I'm angry because that person just called me a fool. That's why I'm angry. They make me angry. Well, no, you have to realize that your reaction is your choice. It's not their choice. They can't make you feel some way. You feel some way because that's your choice. Aha, uh -huh. first thing now is to take responsibility for who you are and what you are. Nobody makes you angry. You choose to be angry. You choose to be angry because you have fear. You have fear that somebody just belittled you. You have fear that other people will see you as less. You have fear that you're gonna lose something you had, whether it's stature or whether it's money or what you have fears, it's that fear that creates that anger. Without the fear, there wouldn't be any anger. After all, what that person says, that's them. Doesn't have anything to do with you. Your anger has everything to do with you, it has nothing to do with them. You see? So we take responsibility for who we are. We find that reason why we're upset, why we're angry, why we're annoyed, and there's always a fear 
at the root of that? Well, that at least lets you find the fear. That kind of pulls, you know, pulls the rug back and lets you get a look at it. But you still have to get rid of it. And you get rid of it by having a strong intent to do so and by working on it. When that fear comes up and that person pushes your button and you start to get angry, stop and say, I feel that anger coming up. You know, I don't want to, it's not that I want to cover it up. You see, you can act more civilized. You can push that anger right back down and smile and be nice and not show that anger. That's not it. We're not talking about acting here. We're talking about being. You got to get rid of that anger, not suppress it. If you suppress it, it just makes things worse. Now you got another thing to deal with. You got to get rid of the anger, not suppress it. You get rid of it by dealing with the fear. And you deal with the fear by first accepting it. All right, there's a fear. Think about how that fear interacts in your life. It makes you angry. It makes you upset. It gives you ulcers. You know, it keeps you awake at night. You can think of all the things it does. It ruins your relationships. And then when you see all that stuff that it does, then you can just work harder on letting it go. Just not having that feeling. Eventually, if you want to not have that feeling with enough sincerity for long enough, it will just go away. You can beat it. It just takes time. The first one that you conquer, the first fear you conquer will be the hardest one. That may take you a year or two. But once you do that, the next one is easier. The next one after that is easier. And pretty soon you can knock those fears off pretty quickly. So that's what you have to do. You want to be an ascended master? Well, get rid of your fear. Once you get rid of your fear, then you live in a bigger reality. You get rid of that ego. And then it doesn't matter what people do. You never get angry. It doesn't upset you. It's, you're not fearful. You're not upset. You don't have stress. You just live in a good space. You're happy. Life is full of joy. What does that mean? That means you're a person of low entropy. You remember all that anger and fear and stuff? All that's high entropy stuff. All oh, that's churning and churning. That's not together. You're not productive that way. And what you'll find is all your relationships will suddenly get better. You know, with your kids, with your coworkers, with your spouse, all your relationships will get a whole lot better because it's not about you anymore. It's about them. What can I give? How can I help? What can I be for them that they need? You see, it's not about what can they give me? What do I need? Am I getting what I need? How can I get more of what I need? How can I make them do what I want them to do and be what I want them to be? See, all of that's ego. All of that's self-centered. When you get rid of that, life is joyful. Life is fun. And you start living in a bigger reality. The more and more you work in that bigger reality, the more, you know, uh, things become obvious to you. You understand how people are feeling and what they're feeling. You don't have to even ask them. They don't have to tell you. And then oh, you're kind of actually aware of what they're thinking too. And then you're aware that the Aunt Susie is ill and, and why she's ill and how you can help her. And things just naturally kind of fall into place. So it's not that you have to go out and learn how to be an ascended master. You just have to be one by getting rid of your fear. And that's what they did. And they did it the same way that you have to do it. They started with you know, exploring their inside space, getting to know it, getting rid of their fear, growing up. And that's what we're all supposed to do. So someday we'll all be ascended masters. You see, we'll all be cooperative and caring and, and understand what this reality is about. And we'll live in bigger pictures. That's kind of the point of it. So you don't, it's not that you have something else to do. It's not that there's a, a, a you know, prescription here, do these things and at the end of six months, you'll be an ascended master. You know, it doesn't work like that. It's not doing, it's being. You have to be differently. And when you be differently, you're not the same person anymore. You're just a different person, a different entity. And that's the growing up that we're supposed to be doing here. That's why we're here in this very tight rule set virtual reality is to learn how to do that. Because sitting in a big chat game is a really makes it a slow process. Here we've got some really interesting tools. Like for instance, one interesting tool is our intent modifies future probability. What we think, our intention will change what happens in the future. 
at least it changes the probability of what happens in the future. Now we have free will. The future is not a done deal, but there's a probabilistic future, something that is likely to happen and some things that aren't likely to happen. And with your intent, you can make those things more likely to happen or less likely to happen. So you can bias that with your intent. That's what drives the placebo effect. That's why we have a placebo effect. Intent modifies future probability. That's how you can heal with your mind. There's also databases up there, databases. We have this future probable database. That's where people get their precognitive dreams from. That's where you change the probabilities in that future probable database. That future probable database has to exist to support the way the virtual reality works. And that's another thing and we probably don't have time to go into, but that's why it's there. It's a part of the structure of the virtual reality. It has to be there. And as time goes by, that, that future probability database turns into a past database. See, in the future was everything that could have happened and the probability that it will. Once it goes through the present, which is just a point in time, then it's everything that could have happened plus you know, the ones that did. So you have this big history database of all the possibilities that could have happened plus the little thread goes through that, which is what actually did happen. But all of that data is available to you. In Hindu theology, that's called the Akashic Records. Well, the Akashic records are just information that's available. They're databases, and you can collect data from them. That's how you can tell what's wrong with Aunt Susie. You can go to the database, and you can look at you know, Aunt Susie's health from the database. That's how you can tell Aunt Susie's spiritual quality, because you can go to that database, and you can look at that. You can even tell this database what output format you want the data to be in. Do you want a graph? You can have a six a six color graph if you want. You know, do you want to be in pictures? Do you want to be it in sound? You know, you want a movie, and it will give you the data. However, it is you'd like to see the data. It's a great database, and you you just access it with query. Your query is your intent, and all that information is, is available. What keeps you from accessing it? Your fear, your ego, and your belief mostly is what keeps you from accessing it. Your access. If, it's, if your intent to access it is coming from the intellect, that's a weak intent. It has to come from the being level. And people who are very left brain and live out of their heads go, huh, what's a being level? You know, they just live out of their heads. They're an intellect, that's all they are is an intellect and they don't understand they have a being level. Some of them who are really kind of deep down that, that, that uh, end of that, that line, they don't even know they have feelings. You know, you have some people that feelings, I don't really have any feelings. I really don't have any emotions. I just live out of my head. I'm logical. You know, well, of course, that's not true. They do have feelings. They do have emotions and they're anything but logical. They just think they are logical. Most humans are not logical. We do whatever we do. And then we try to justify it by making up some sort of <laughs> logic to justify it. But mostly we don't do things that are logical. Anyhow, that's uh, maybe a Maybe I've answered some of the things you wanted. Maybe I've gone a little further, yeah. but let, I'm going to let you jump back in and see if you can't steer this some other place. Yeah, no, wonderful, man. Again, just just such an amazing insight. Um, you know, you're kind of mirroring what I've been talking about on the podcast quite a bit is uh, for me, you know, enlightenment or, or that expanded awareness is simply two things. One is radical responsibility. Every single thing that happens to you in your life and your experience, you take responsibility for, because if you don't, you're a victim, you can't be a creator. And the second characteristic I'm finding with interviewing people like you all the time is that they're of service to others. It really is. They go from selfish to selfless. You know, how can I serve? How can I grow? How can I give? So again, you're just mirroring. Um, and that, that, that doesn't happen in the mind. It happens in the being level. You know, you right. either are doing that or you are not doing that. So I think well, that's, you uh, either are being that or you're not being that because there are people who are pretty good actors. You can act that mm -hmm. role. And that's different than being it. You can act like a nice person. You can act when something makes you angry. You can stifle that anger and smile and you can act nice. And we all learn that, you know, we call that manners. You know, we, we have these manners where we, we uh, suppress a lot of our, you know, what we, what we feel and we just do what is socially acceptable most of the time. And that acting makes us more civilized. We get along better because of those manners, but it doesn't help us grow up any. You see, manners aren't a growing thing. 
Manners just make us more civilized. They, they help us act better, but they don't help us be better. You have to not be angry because you're just not, because whatever was said or done or whatever uh, is not about you. You see, it's not, uh, there's no anger involved in it. You don't have any ego attached to it, no fear attached to it, no belief attached to it. That's why you're not angry, not because you suppress it. So it's a matter of being, not a matter of doing. And we in this, this kind of left brain dominant world that we live in, we want to solve all the problems by doing. We want to get out of body by doing. We want to grow up by doing. You know, we want to get rid of our fears by doing. We want to do everything by doing. We want to do something. But doing is not really what it's all about. It's being. You have to be different, not do different things. Okay, the intellect is a good tool. It gives us direction. It helps us take steps and move in the right direction. But if at the same time we're not changing at a being level, it just makes us more civilized to be polite. It doesn't make us more grown up. So there are people who are good at faking it, if you will, or good at smiling when they're when they're really not happy and at uh, you know pretending to be a lot more grown up than they are. Sometimes they even tricking themselves, not just tricking others, they tricking themselves as well. But that's not what it's about. It's not about behavior. It's about what's inside. Now, what's inside does change your behavior, right? If you're love and peace inside, then you behave differently than if you're not. But it's, uh, it's, it's a matter of, of changing yourself at a being level. That's the key thing, because most of us want to go out and do something. And that really doesn't get us there if we don't take the next step, which to take responsibility. We are who we are because those are our choices. Now, what am I going to do about that? Well, first step then, get authentic, right? Don't be just polite. Don't be just an image. Get authentic. Own it. All right. Maybe it's not too pretty. When you're authentic, there may be some ugliness in there. Own it. That's you. Live it and own it. And then if it bites you, if you don't like that, because that ugliness hurts your relationships and hurts other things, then change it. Get rid of it. Don't cover it up. But you can't even deal with it if you you know, if you're in denial that you have it, you see? So that's where most of us are with our fears. You know, we, we're kind of in denial that it's really the fear that's the problem. Somebody else, it's hit, you know, that person makes me angry. You know, it's not my fear, not my problem. That person does it to me. So yes, you got to first get authentic and you got to own it. Then you got to change it if you don't like it. That's kind of the key. Now that's again, easy to say, harder to do, but you know, you've got, uh, you know, all the rest of your life to work on it. It's uh, not like it's a time test. You know, you, uh, it's a lifetime job. Well, actually, it's more than a lifetime job. It's a multiple lifetime job, but there's no time like the present to get working on it. Yeah, yeah, 100 percent. You actually touched on a point that I was going to bring up is we're talking about the ego or it's just people are going around with masks. There's a very real lack of authenticity from day to day, you know, to people and just being real and honest and humble with where you are. And if you can start to be that way, you're going to uncover your own layers, uh, layers of your own inauthenticity. But, uh, you know, people are walking around with masks on, you know, and in large portion and it takes a lot of courage to walk without one, um, yes. you know, to be, to, to express yourself honestly, to move forward. And when you can start to do that, uh, you're going to have an internal change and then your reality is going to change as well. Um, exactly and, right. and one of the questions I had is, um, with, with moving towards, um, uh, you know, this group collective consciousness, I just had uh, Roger Nelson on from uh, the Global Consciousness Project, and he talked about the noosphere. And, um, you know, basically, it's the collective uh, consciousness of everybody affecting our entire reality and measuring that. Um, from your perspective, do you see a, a consciousness shift coming in, in where we can more, maybe, maybe more people experience the reality that you're experiencing to be able to access these different states or, um, or anything along, along those lines, right? We hear, you know, words about evolution or expanded consciousness. Do you, do you see that coming down the pipe for humanity as a whole? I do. I see uh, some big changes coming in what I would call the near future. Of course, when you're talking about conscious evolution, you know, that, that's measured in millennia <laughs> and centuries, you know. But so when I say in the near term, though, I'm talking about 
as near as maybe a couple of decades, you know, maybe within a couple of decades, uh, you know, certainly within three or four or five decades, but I'm hoping within one or two, we're going to have a major shift in awareness. And I think what's going to drive that shift in awareness, uh, this will be surprising to, to you, I suspect, and the listeners is physics. Physics, physics is going to be the driver, you see. And why is that? Well, I call the physicists the high priests of Western culture. Physicists now replace the high priests. You see, we had high priests a long time ago, and the high priest's job is to tell everybody else what to believe, what's true and what's not true. Well, that's what the scientists do today. Scientists tell us what to believe, what's true and what's not true. Uh, if the scientists say, oh, that's bogus, well, then that's it. It's bogus, you know, and most everybody will believe that that's bogus and so on. So scientists are now the new high priests. And this idea of virtual reality that I was talking about, um, and I told you earlier that it does better physics. Well, that's true. It does better physics so well and so much that physicists all over this planet are starting to see that virtual reality is the only thing that will answer the experiments, the only thing that will explain the experiments. Again, more and more experiments going on, and you just can't explain them with a materialistic viewpoint. It doesn't work. It's a bad theory. You can explain them with a virtual reality viewpoint. You see, understanding uh, just what we went through, you know, consciousness is fundamental and so on. If you have that viewpoint, then you can understand these experiments. So physicists are picking up on that. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when I came out with my books, me and a handful of other people thought virtual reality was a good idea. Now there's thousands of people, tens of thousands of people. Most of them are physicists that think virtual reality is a good idea. And it's not because that's a becoming fad, it's because nothing else works as well. So here's the, here's the kind of the paradigm shifts that are coming as I see it. When physics gets to the point that they say, we're living in a virtual reality, and here's all the experiments that show that that's it. And that becomes a fact, you see, because physics tells us facts. When living in a virtual reality becomes a fact, then, that will be like throwing a hand grenade under the, you know, in the tent. That is going to change everything. One, they're the high priests, so everybody will believe that. Secondly, even a three-year-old will have enough logic to say, well, where's the computer? Who's the programmer? Where's this virtual reality come from? You see, virtual reality has to be outside of the reality. So as soon as physicists say this is a virtual reality, just because their physics experiments tell them that, everybody else is going to look at that and say, well, wait a minute, who's the programmer? Where's the computer? They've just, the physicists won't actually, well, they do know it, but they'll, they'll try to downplay that. But what they're saying is that our reality is computed someplace else. There's a higher level of existence than us. You see, now that's a big deal coming from the mouth of physicists. That changes everything. And when they change that, this idea about, uh, well, who's the programmer? Because they won't think of this as a not programmed reality, an evolved reality instead of programmed. People will think of a programmer. Right away, you're going to have a bunch of religious people jumping on board that boat saying, my God's the best programmer. No, my God's the best programmer. You know, we're going to get into, you know, that sort of thing. But if we have enough sense to get through that and say, this isn't about a programmer, you know, this is consciousness is the programmer. Consciousness, actually, this is an evolved reality, not a programmed one. We've got a big digital bang, not a, not a physical bang. We've got initial conditions of a small ball of plasma under high temperature and high pressure. And when we hit the run button, it's going to change according to the rule set. It expands, you know, it cools, we get suns, you know, we plants, we've been through all that big bang theory, and that's just the simulation. So when we see that, then we won't, you know, we'll realize that this is a, you know, this consciousness system isn't a 
supernatural system is just a natural system trying to survive like all things do. And it has to do that by lowering entropy, which means love, cooperation, peace, you know, that sort of thing. So if we get that picture and the high priests of science tell us that there is this other realm of, that's, that we are a subset of, there is some superset in which the computer lives and in which our awareness exists. Well, that's a big step forward. Suddenly, that's going to blow the doors wide open. You see, we could devolve into a religious war again. You know, whose God's the better programmer? That would be unfortunate. You know, that's to get stuck in that nonsense, you know, would be unfortunate. But hopefully, we won't. Hopefully, we will be aware enough to realize that, yes, this is a bigger reality. Yes, there's been lots of people telling us that for a very long time. Now we can look back to the Buddha and to the, all the ascended masters. A lot of others have been explaining this to us for you know the last 2,500 years, and we can put two to two together, and things will start to look like there's a bigger picture. See, right now, the picture is just this physical universe. That's the whole picture. There is no other picture. Well, once that becomes not true, because this is a virtual reality, virtual realities have to have a bigger picture. They don't compute themselves. Then you see it kind of blows the whole thing apart. Now it's not a matter of, of uh, you know, religion versus science anymore. Science is saying, yeah, verbally, we're in a subset. There's a superset that makes all this work. So that puts us in a whole different state, different state altogether. And hopefully in a, in a, in a decade or so, we can kind of absorb all that and figure out, well, what does this really mean to us? And hopefully if there's enough people on the planet that do see a bigger picture, we can kind of steer it to a more productive result rather than regressing into religious wars. You see, I don't think we'll do that. I believe we're maybe smart enough now that we won't take that path, although there will be those who will try to push us to that path, and there will be those that will flock to that path because that's where belief takes you. That's where fear takes you. But hopefully there'll be enough that we won't stay there long or we won't go there at all. And when people understand the nature of a virtual reality and understand that consciousness is the computer, the next paradigm shift is, well, if consciousness is computer, then love is the answer. That's what we're here about. Once they understand what consciousness is, the fact that love is the answer is the next logical step after that. So I see that our technology and our science and our internet are all going to play a big role in this. You see, we've had these little bubbles of enlightenment, let's call them, for centuries, for millennia, all over. But they've all been isolated. Okay, the Buddha and his little group, yeah, they started a big movement that's still chugging along today with millions of adherents, but still, it's all isolated. They're all isolated within their own areas, geographically, within their own languages. It's not worldwide. It's not collective. There's bigger groups that say, ah, nonsense. You know, that's a lot of belief baloney. You know, we don't have to go there. What we need to do is make more money. You know, we have a lot of that going on. But when we have an internet now, all these little bubbles of enlightenment are starting to feed each other. See, you talk, me, you talk to me about several of these things that you probably are aware of because there's an internet. Otherwise, you'd have had to go down to a library someplace and look all this stuff up. Well, that didn't happen. The reason you know this is because there's an internet. You're aware of these things. You're aware of you know, maybe Krishnamurti, you know, maybe you know who that is, you know, you, you're aware of the Sufis and you're aware of, you know, it all starts to work together because we have an internet, we have this, this big awareness going on now. So it's not going to be so easy for the people to say, oh, my God's the better programmer, everybody follow me, you see, because a lot of people are going to have a bigger picture than that now. So because we have the internet, because all these bubbles of enlightenment feed each other, can cooperatively feed each other. And when we have the high priests tell us in no uncertain terms that we're a subset of something larger, and that larger thing is non-physical, well, you know, stuff's going to happen. 
See, we've got all the right ingredients. So for the first time ever in the history of humanity, we have all the pieces together. We've got the high priest telling us that there's a higher thing. Well, yes, but now it's science. It's not just a belief-based thing. Yeah, okay, but you got to believe what I believe if you're going to get on my train. You know, now it's not about believing anything. Belief is irrelevant. This is science. There's this higher order existence. That's a science. It's not belief. Everybody's everybody can come to this party. You don't have to believe anything or swear or you know make a creed or donate money. You know, tenth of your income every you know every uh, year or anything. You just it's science. It's there for everyone, and we're all plugged in to all the bigger picture stuff that's around for everybody to come to. So yes, I see that as being the first time in the history of mankind have we had all the pieces together. We got an it wouldn't work without the internet. Even if all the scientists said, yay, verily, you know, we live in a virtual reality and we're just a subset. If there was no internet, well, 100 people would know. 10 years later, 200 people would know, you know. And, oh, yeah, they printed in their journals and things and whatever. And it would be, yeah, okay, they say that, but they probably don't know what they're talking about. You know, it wouldn't be what it can be because we've got an internet. So we've got an internet that lets us communicate worldwide instantly. Wow, that's a powerful tool. And we're going to have science that has become the high priest that everybody believes because that's just rational stuff. That's not belief stuff. You know? But you can, you can bet on that. That's experiments backing that up, you see. So we've got all of that. Never, never happened before in the history of man that we had these things all together at the same time. So, yes, in another decade, this thing could do that. I have noticed that from, like I said, decade and a half ago, me and three other people thought virtual reality was a good idea. Now there's tens of thousands of people who think it's a good idea. Most of them are scientists, you see. Uh, that's in a decade, you know, a decade and a half. That's a lot. You know, it's gone up by, you know, 100,000% more people. Well, that's pretty big. So I'm thinking in another decade and a half from now, we will already have gotten to the point where virtual reality is the answer. Yes, there, we're a subset of something bigger and it's non-physical. And suddenly all the stuff that's paranormal and the meditation and the out-of-body, it all starts to make sense. You know, that's what science does. Science takes things that used to be mystical and, and un, non-understandable and turns them into things that are normal and understandable. That's what science has always done, right? From, you know, what are the, you know, why do we have four seasons? You know, well, that was mystical because God gave us four seasons is why we have them. But no, we find out it's because the earth has a, you know axis on an angle and it goes around the sun and different parts of the earth, you know, are in the sunshine and in the shade at different times. So science makes things that used to be mystical normal. That's what it's going to do with the paranormal. We're going to understand how remote viewing works. Oh, it's just getting data out of a database. Healing, oh yeah, intent modifies future probability and all this stuff will start to make sense once we get this bigger picture. And when that does, you see, we're in a whole different probability space now. Right now, we collective consciousness have a very limited set of choices of where we can go because our beliefs and our fears limit us. When our beliefs get shattered by virtual reality and the new science, then you know, we'll still have all those fears to deal with, and that'll be a little rough, but I think we have a chance in two, three decades of turning this thing around to where be people become aware of themselves as individuated units of consciousness that are here to grow up and become love. That would make a huge difference, a really huge difference. So it wouldn't be just you and I talking about this. It would be you and I and 800 million other people would be doing the same things that we're doing, you see, and that will change everything. Then the other, you know, 6 billion will come along. They'll come along for the ride. They'll do what everybody else does. And suddenly, you know, they'll be into it too. They'll be thinking about it and doing it and taking responsibility. And that'll just be the thing to do. So that's the way I see it coming. So yeah, I think on the horizon, we've got uh, all the elements together. First time ever. So it's just when, when is it all going to happen? You know, what's going to be the thing that kicks it off and it all happens. But I think those physicists 
who come out with virtual reality are going to be what kicks it off because they're in the position as the high priests to get everybody's attention because we know science only speaks truth. <laughs> we believe that, you know, scientists are believers just like everybody else. They have a belief in materialism and it's hard to get that, you know, cr those cracks are in there, but it's hard to tear that apart. That's going to be the first big paradigm shift is to finally, you know, put, put the rest as belief in materialism. But scientists will tell you materialism doesn't work. I mean, most of them still will claim they're materialists, but they see it coming apart and it doesn't work and it frightens them some. That's why they're dragging their feet, but they can't hold it back. You see, that's the thing about truth. Eventually it rises to the top. Eventually it comes to the top. So even if it's, you try to suppress truth, it will eventually come to the top particularly with a bunch of scientists, because they're really committed to truth anyway, even if they spend a lot of time avoiding it because it doesn't feel good. It'll eventually come to the truth. You know, what was it, Planck? Planck who said famously...